there is more inequality within the best of 1% in Britain than there is within the other 99%. What you're seeing here is a map of the country where area has been sized to make each region proportional to the wealth of the super rich. What I've also done is to highlight the 24 richest families in the country. There is one in each region, including one in the Channel Islands, and there are 10 in London. And in London, those little circles have them sized by the size of their wealth. And what you can see immediately, the bulk of the super rich in this country live in London. But for all of them living in London, the richest 10 families are taking a third of all the wealth. So it's not that hard if you're in a member of the super rich not to feel that you're taking an enormous amount because you can look up at those 10 families and say, well, my millions are fairly modest compared to the millions above me. I couldn't possibly afford to buy a house on Bishop's Avenue or, or ever. And this may sound a bit flippant, but this is the kind of story you get all the way down throughout the 1% and a little bit beneath. I'm not that well off. The people above me are much better off. I have enough just to be able to get by. The very interesting thing that has happened since 2008 is that a new cleavage has emerged between the 1% and those beneath them. The incomes and certainly the wealth but the incomes of the 1%, including people at the bottom of the 1%, have been rising since 2008. There was a small blip, but then it came up. Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs released figures in spring showing that the 1% had had their biggest ever, I think, increase in, in income. The 1% have been getting richer and richer more quickly very recently. And you'll know that average standards of living and average wages have gone down since 2008 particularly at the bottom, and benefit changes mean that people at the bottom are going to sink down even further. The Institute of Fiscal Studies published a report last year showing that for 99% of us, income inequality since the Great Crash has reduced so that the Gini coefficient of inequality is now back to what it was in 1990. So we are more in it together, except for the 1%. And it's, it's no good being all in it together if you do have 1% moving off. At this point, you're probably wondering, am I in the 1%? What is the 1%? What's the, what's the qualifying level uh, to be in the 1%? If you've got spare surplus money, that is money you can realise, you could easily downsize from a house or so on, or you own more than one property, of about a million in your household, you're in the 1% by wealth. By income, the cutoff point to get in the 1% is a gross income before tax of 160,000 for your household if there are two of you and you have no kids. Kids, you're looking at about 200, 220,000 pounds because there are expenses that comes with kids. If you're single, you can get in the 1% uh, with 100,000 pounds. Uh, I talked to a journalist earlier this week from the Evening Standard about these things, and he kind of got the wrong end of the stick. And so if you read the Evening Standard a couple of days ago, you'll see an article about what you need to do to get into the 1%. Um, <laughs> and he, he didn't kind of get the idea. And it's amazing how many people don't get the idea that not only can you not all get in the 1%, but in fact, never more than 1% of people can get in the 1%. <laughs> um, but I did, I did think that the, the way that article was written was indicative of one of the problems of gross inequality, in that we begin to get a society which begins to try to address these problems by saying to people, well, this is what you need to try to get up there. Your only chance is to get up. And we kind of dumb ourselves down in a way. The 1% are taking each year now about 15% of all income. You have to go back to the early 1930s to find the 1% taking this much. There is nowhere else you can go in Europe to find the 1% taking as much. We are the dunce of Europe. We are the most unequal country in Europe by far. If you want a nearby country that's doing very well, it's the Netherlands. The 1% in the Netherlands take just under 7% of all income.
a country that in some ways is more like us because they have lots of bankers, is Switzerland. And in Switzerland, the 1% are taking about half as much as our 1%. Swiss bankers get salaries which are half as much uh, as our bankers. And I don't think they do a worse job at banking in Switzerland. <laughs> um, banking really matters, increasingly matters in the 1%. The 1% used to be a more diverse set of people, uh, but many of the professions that used to just about tip into the 1%, this would be head teachers of very large schools, it would be doctors or surgeons doing very well, they've just about dropped out. There are hardly any GPs in the 1%, and there are about 200. Almost all of the GPs that are in the 1% have interests on the side. I think there are almost no head teachers that are in the 1%. It's increasingly full of financiers and managers. The European Commission uh, now surveys salaries in banks. Uh, we don't. You have to go to Europe to actually find out about incomes at the top. We have over 2,200 bankers in this country paid over a million euros a year. The next highest country after our 2,200 is Germany, which has a larger population. Germany has 197 go to Barclays, you'll see Barclays has over 300 members of staff paid over a million. If you look at the whole of Japan, a country with twice our population, and you look across all of finance and industry in Japan, you will not find 300 people paid over a million. Why do we do it? Because we're so closely connected to the USA, where these kinds of salaries in New York, New York are seen as not being unreasonable, and because so many of our bankers move, well, they don't move that fast back and forward, to be honest. Um, but they do often have had a job there and a job back again. There really is a problem of, of perception about these things because you begin to get people working in finance and, and living in London in the cities that see very high incomes as being particularly low incomes. And while you have that kind of mentality, it becomes very hard to actually argue for change, to get things to change, because people say they can't possibly manage on less. We need to see this as a serious problem. And one way of seeing it as a serious problem is to say, what happens if we don't begin to address it? What happens if the current trajectories carry on? If the best off 1% continue to sail upwards, if the group just beneath them, the 2%, the 3%, the 4%, continue to move down, which they're doing, they've lost child benefit, which is small, but they haven't seen pay rises either. What kind of society do you head towards? if we carry on on our current trajectory. And there are at least two ways of, of looking at that. One way is to look across at the United States and to see what society is like in the United States, to look at people's pensions in the United States and what's happening to most people in the US. In the US, the top 1% take 20% of all income. And the other way in which we can look at where we're heading at the moment is to look back in our past and to go back to Downton Abbey times and just to reverse it. And then you've got to ask yourself, which of my children will in future become a servant for a member of the 1%? Um, because that's the way you're currently heading at the moment. <laughs>